I came back to art with this very strong kid influence. And I didn't have the baggage of art school to make me feel embarrassed about that. So um, I was able to really at, at 29, 30 years old, just kind of go with where my interests were. I feel very fortunate. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world insider podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hello there, passion maker. This is Miriam Shulman, your curator of inspiration. And you're listening to episode number 189 of the Inspiration Place podcast. I am so grateful that you're here. Today, we're talking to an artist who hasn't always been an artist, and her mother didn't encourage her to be an artist, as might be the story for many of you listening. I know for myself, my own mother didn't believe I could make a living as an artist and definitely discouraged me. For today's guest, her mother was an artist and probably struggled with her mental health. So part of her own journey has been healing that and learning to trust her inner voice and not the imaginary voice of her mother who didn't encourage her. But before we get into today's interview, I wanted to make sure you knew that I have a free masterclass that will help you get started painting portraits in watercolor. When I first started drawing portraits, I used to struggle to get a likeness using academic methods until I learned what now I call a taboo technique that easily captures people's likenesses. And I discovered it's actually the dirty secret behind many professional portrait artists. They use this forbidden technique but they don't want you to know what it is because they're worried that you're going to think they're cheating. (sighs) After completing dozens of commissioned portraits that make my clients ooh and ah, I folded this technique and other shortcuts into my 5P portrait painting process. And I taught this process to hundreds of my students so that they too could create portraits of their children and their grandchildren and their loved ones that they could be proud of. In this free masterclass, you'll discover the five P's of of this painting process. And believe me, the third P is a total game changer. You'll also learn the watercolor advantage. This allows you to use the special shortcut that I teach that makes the whole process that much easier, as well as uncover that taboo technique I mentioned that most portrait artists don't want you to know. And this one technique will definitely help you get past your doubt that you can do it. Plus, the best part is you'll get to watch me demonstrate live to see these principles in action. To sign up for this free masterclass, which by the way, it's less than an hour, and you can choose between a bunch of different times and days, go to shulmanart.com forward slash demo, as in D-E-M-O. Now on with the show. Today's guest is a painter, illustrator, and creativity workshop instructor known for her fun and innovative projects and techniques designed to help adult students rediscover a more spontaneous, playful approach to creating. She's the author of three instructional art books, including Drawing Lab for Mixed Media Artists, 52 Creative Exercises to Make Drawing Fun. Drawing and Painting Imaginary Animals, a Mixed Media Workshop, and The Art of Silliness, a creativity book for everyone. Together with her husband, Steve, they produce online art classes in drawing, painting, and mixed media through carlasinem.com. Please welcome to the inspiration place, Carla Sinem. Well, hey there, Carla. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. 
Well, I'm so excited to talk to you. First of all, where in the world are you? I live right now um, near Seattle, Washington, in, in the town right below, right south of Seattle. Um, we've been here 12 years, but I've spent my adult life moving from different states every 10 years or so. So I've landed in the Seattle area. Our grandkids are here. We, we love it. So we're here. We, we figure our next adventure when we hit 10 years was to stay where we are. So, <laughs> so we're going to stay in Seattle for at least another few years. <laughs> um, my childhood was all about moving around like every two years. So when I, when my husband and I got married, I said, we're staying in this house forever. And actually forever just ended. So we oh. are um, selling our home of 25 years. And wow. yeah, and now we're moving to New York City and it almost feels like preparing for the afterlife since I had <laughs> always thought we'd live here forever. And now right. it's like, no, there's a whole nother life after this one. So. That oh, that's kind of, exciting. New York City is wonderful. It's kind of cool getting older. Like when we were young, we always thought, I don't, maybe you didn't have this feeling, but to me, it's like, I always feel this every decade, like, wow, I'm just getting started. And wow, this is so exciting. Do you feel that way too? Totally. I, I felt like I felt like my 20s and even my 30s were sort of the most pressure I put on myself for not getting enough done, like not being further ahead. And it's sort of like I just kept living and working. And and by I'm I'm 58. And when I see myself now, I'm kind of like, oh, I've done some things. <laughs> but it never felt like I was doing enough, right? And now in my 50s, I'm feeling like. Uh, it's, it's good. There's enough years have gone by, uh, enough drawings have been made. I, I have something. <laughs> cool. I've always admired. Um, so I've been kind of aware of your art for a long time. I've always admired like your whimsical cats. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I bet that's a popular class too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm really lucky because, um, I think even though at the time I didn't think I was lucky, I, I wasn't encouraged to follow art when I was, you know, young, going to college. Join the club. And so I, I took a sort of a wrong turn into law office kind of stuff. Anyway, I didn't come back to art until I was 30-ish and had a five-year-old. So by that time, I was very, very inspired and in love with his style of art. It just, there was something so raw and, and beautiful about his uh, little animals or cars or, or airplanes that he would draw. His name is Krister. And so I came back to art with this very strong kid influence. And I didn't have the baggage of art school to make me feel embarrassed about that. So um, I was able to really at, at 29, 30 years old, just kind of go with where my interests were. I feel very fortunate that. Because I think I'm the kind of person that might have, it might have taken a lot to sort of overcome the rules that I met in art school that I learned. It's been a better journey for me to try to just really go where my interests are and, of course, learn things and get better and take life drawing and do things along the way. But um, central, I think, has always been, do I like what I'm making? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, Carla, so you started immersing yourself when you're 29 or 30. Did, had you taken art classes in college or high school or did it was more like you stumbled upon art when you were um, that age, when you were in your late 20s? I was very artistic as a child, I, like a young child. I was kind of known for it. Like I was the artist of the family kind of thing. And then uh, my, my mom happened to be a middle school art teacher and she never considered herself an artist, but I think that held a lot of weight for me. And um, when I was 16, she made a, a very sort of unfortunate and life-changing comment to me about something that I was working on uh, in anger. And so I quit art at 16. I, I had taken a few art classes in high school, but it's in my sophomore year, I decided I was just too busy for art. I mean, I didn't really link it to my mom's comment until much later, until but- therapy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh looking back it, it's a little bit too coincidental that what happened is she she said something like oh you think this is so good and I had thought it was so good I really did think it was so good I thought I was making something for a contest and I thought I was going to win and 
all of a sudden the curtains were, you know, opened and I'm like, I'm, it isn't that good. I'm not that good. And it was almost like a reality check that maybe I could have gotten a little more gently, <laughs> like by not winning the contest. <laughs> I shudder to think about what comments my kids are going to unearth in their therapy sessions 20 years from now. It's like, right. you know, oh, mom, you remember that time you said this? I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Are you sure that was me? <laughs> right. I think uh, my mom is gone now, but I think she would be and I, which has allowed me to be able to talk about it a little more openly, but I think she would be very upset that she said that and, you know, sorry and everything. And I just didn't have the skills at the time to kind of, I didn't have the confidence. So anyway, I put art aside for basically 15, well, 14 years, Mm -hmm. but I always kind of dabbled in my twenties, making little zine books and little drawings, but nothing it was always a kind of a source of a secret passion that I never really developed. But okay, at 29, so I you're 29, you have a five year old, and you're starting to do art. Were you working outside of the home as well at this time? Yes, by that time, I was working as a graphic designer at a book publishing company. Oh, and okay. I had just gotten married. And my husband, Steve, who I'm still married to, encouraged me to take art classes at the and also my boss at the time, who my my boss at this book publishing company, both my husband and her said, go do it now, go take a class now. So I took some classes at the City College. And um, so you were in New York, going, huh? You were in New York City College in Queens? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> um, a City College. Okay, so see, a I'm from college. New York. So whenever you say city, yeah, <laughs> there's only <laughs> one city. Yeah. Okay. No, we were in Chicago suburbs in Wheaton okay. at the time. So I think it was called the DuPage College of Art. It was just a, a two-year college um, and actually some great teachers there. But uh, I really learned uh, a lot about everything. So uh, you were but, working in a uh, creative field. You were in graphic. You did get a graphic design degree and you were... No. What were you <laughs> doing for the book publisher? I'm confused. Oh, no. I, I majored in history. Okay. I thought I was going to go to law school. I ended up getting pregnant um, when I was 24. And at that moment, I decided if I'm going to be a single mom, which I was at the time, I need to enjoy what I'm doing. So I switched from law office work to publishing. And for a long time, I worked as an editor writer in publishing. And then when I got married, I decided to switch careers again and start with graphic design. So um, I'm self-taught in just every aspect of everything. And and believe me, when by the time I got into my 40s, I'm like, what am I, what have I done with my life? <laughs> you know, I've been a beginner and a beginner and a beginner and a beginner. Um, but it it looking back, it all was training ground to what I'm doing now. So so when did you make the leap from I'm painting for myself or I'm creating for myself to I'm going to monetize this, either selling your art, selling your designs or teaching. And I'm not quite sure in your journey, what you started doing first. You can tell me that as well. Well, I was working at a, um, by this time I was working at a magazine as an art director and I had a very, very busy schedule. And I, um, I was pretty unhappy in the job because There's just, you know, office politics are very hard for me. (laughs) I, um, I'm really an honest person. And whenever there's like a little dishonest stuff going on, it really, it hurts my heart. Right. So I was pretty unhappy. And so we decided that my husband would sort of support us for a while with his photography work. And it was during that time I started, um, I was more free to both do my own art and also volunteer at my son's elementary school classrooms. So I was sort of a parent going in and and teaching kids art projects. You know, the the teacher found out I was creative. And so I started doing that. And so for the next few years, I basically was sort of just trying to make it as, as an artist. I was trying to get into little galleries. And um, then we moved to Colorado, a small town that was an artist town. And I really tried to make it as an artist. And I had my fingers in all kinds of pots. But the teaching is what I was really passionate about the teaching. I loved to teach. Um, I loved to teach the kids. And then I started getting asked to teach adults. And so when 
I was meeting these adults who were, uh, they loved to collage and paint, but they were afraid to draw. And so I started teaching the adults in the same way that I taught the kids. And that is real drawing assignments, but in a fun way. And so... And that's what you still do now, right? And that's what I still do. <laughs> you, teach, you have a very accessible, whimsical style that I Thank know you. the students love. Okay. Thank so when you. did you start teaching online then? So my son, one of my sons was in high school and my husband was traveling a lot for his work. And then I was traveling a lot teaching live and I missed a very key concert where he was like the solo trumpet player. And I missed it. I just missed it. And I, I thought I can't miss the rest of his high school concerts. And so at, right at that time, um, online teaching started to happen. And um, also my book came out, Drawing Lab for Mixed Media Artists. And so in order to publicize the book, so this was 2010, I decided to have this like quick online class to kind of like get, get excitement up for the book. Okay. So wait, online... I got to interrupt you. So you got okay. the, the book deal before the online class. Is that right? How did you get the yeah. book deal? Like how did because, because I was teaching at these mixed media events, maybe like, five like or that six. Art, create art. I forget the names of them. Those really big ones that they yeah, had. Like, and... Well, at the time it was Art Fest and Art and Soul, right? And Art, art Unravel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. And so um, Marianne Hall, who was the editor of Quarry Books at the time, she would go to these events and try to meet potential authors. Cool. So um, I met her once, and we kind of hit it off, and actually. My first proposal to her as a for to do a drawing book, they didn't want it because they said they don't do drawing books. They're a mixed media, you know, collage painting kind of thing. But I, I sort of showed them what I meant, <laughs> that it wasn't a traditional drawing book, yeah. that it was incorporating your own hand into your mixed media work. And so then I got that book uh, contract and it did really well, which is why I do what I do now, because that book is sort of still a platform the, for you. Yes. It's yes. been the, the, the seed. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. So anyway, to, to, to uh, market the book, I did an online class that was no video, just PDF based. And then about a year or two later, I'm like, uh, I asked my photographer husband who knows a little bit about video now, you know, can you just set me up with my iPhone so I can do a video? And he said, no, I can't. And I'm we like, need what? a camera. We need a video camera, right? Yeah. He's like, we're going to do it right if we're going to do it. <laughs> and I remember being so frustrated, like, why does he have to make everything so hard? But uh, anyway, of course. But in some uh, ways it would... makes it easier. So just so you and, and also the listeners know. So I started my first online video class also around 2012, 2013, and what I did was I got this high school student. I said, show me what video camera to get. Show me what video editing software to use. And I still use it. And I still make the argument that it makes things easier to do it that way. What do you, do you feel that way now? Or have you switched to the iPhone for doing things? Oh, no. And it's certainly easier for me because oh, I'm no, very which? Oh, no. Yes. You, you still use the video camera or oh, no. Now you do the iPhone. What? We still use the video yeah, camera. Okay, right. Steve is a photographer through and through. So yeah. he has the three camera set up and he, um, oh, he's wow. the production guy. And, and somewhere around fi maybe 15, 16, he came over full time to do the online classes oh, with me. Great. Um, yeah. So um, at first it was just me teaching online classes. And then about the time he came over, that's when we started adding other teachers. Okay. So we're, we're kind of a production. I mean, not, it's not, uh, we're not, producing all the time, but we do do about seven or eight new classes a year with guest teachers. That's awesome. And so from what I understand then is they come to you and you actually film and produce the class. It's not like this. Yes. That's awesome. Okay. Yes. we. My husband, again, being so such a stickler for quality, we never really felt, we did try it once or twice to have an artist send in some, you know, a video that they had taken, but he, he couldn't, couldn't get his head around having uh, such a difference in yeah. sound quality or, yeah. or lighting or whatever. He really loves the consistency and everything. So we do it. We I do agree it. And that's actually. why we can only do seven or eight classes a year. Wow. That's fantastic. All right. So that leads me now to uh, another question. 
So you got your start doing these in-person events. And I know in 2020, these have all sadly been shut down. In fact, somebody though messaged me today and said, do you know of any in-person things starting up again? Are you still involved in those communities? You teach in person? Do you know that these things are happening again yet? Uh, I, b- I believe the art and soul events are still are happening again. Um, I don't teach in those events anymore, really, because the online class, I, I, I'm sort of like, uh, I can only do one thing well at one time, you know, <laughs> and online classes is a focus right now. Although I, before the pandemic, I did uh, always make a point of trying to teach one workshop a year and take one workshop a year so that I can remember what it's like to be a yes. student and I can remember what it's like to be in a, a real-time classroom so that when I'm doing on video, I'm remembering those questions or, or the problems that people are having. I couldn't um, agree so- with you more. That was something that when I was building my online classes that I kept working as an in-person teacher and it definitely wasn't for the money. <laughs> you yeah. know, it was like a community thing. But it yeah. really helped my my teaching because then when I was teaching, I could anticipate yes. what it was people would be struggling with, where if you're yes. only teaching online, you can't do that. And in fact, when right. artists come to me and they want to build an online class, I said, I tell them, teach something in person first, make sure yes. you know what it is that people want to learn, want to do, and what they're going to struggle with. Exactly. Yes. And so um, my my live teaching these past five years or so has been through um, Belisama Art Escapes, which is a smaller, she she does some classes in uh, Washington State here, but she off, I taught in Mexico. So she, it's like this whole, you know, it's like a week long trip that we take and we eat really well and we make art for a week. So that those that has been my that has until the pandemic, that was my teaching outlet every year. So that's where you teach, not where you take. That's right. That's right. The eating really well got my attention by. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, oh, eating really well and art. That's (laughs) great. Kathy Vizani used to work. She's the organizer or she's the owner and she used to work doing events for chefs. So she knows all the great places to eat. And, and yeah, so she really, she, it's kind of like it's this double, uh, you know, art and good food. (laughs) Very fun. (laughs) That's that's really fun. Okay. So how do you get inspired? Well, I would say that if I'm in a good place mentally, which is not always the case, because I do have clinical depression. And even though it's managed so well now, uh, after so many years, I I'm on the right medication. I, I have good support around me. Everything's fine, but you know, there's some days, chink, uh, it goes down. Um, go I, lose. on those days, I'm not inspired by anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but most of the time I'm doing pretty well. And I, I would say that I, whew. you know, the last few years has been really hard for, for a lot of us artists sources of our inspiration have were dried up now it's only just beginning again like if if travel was something that so I'm not going to talk about me personally so for me personally mm-hmm. I'm sp- having lunch with friends going into New York City traveling all those things were suddenly taken away and yeah. I know for me personally that took a huge toll on my inspiration and creativity and when you continue to be teaching as, as I was, and I assume you were as well during the same time, then you're constantly helping other people get inspired and your own creative well starts to run really dry. I just want to acknowledge that challenge. Yes, um, it did. Of course, when the pandemic sort of, we all were so surprised in March of 2020 and we didn't know how, you know, what was going to happen. And suddenly teachers, we had to cancel all the teachers that were coming to film. And I, I basically spent the next two years kind of making up for like having to step up my teaching uh, more than I had been. Right. To, so you were forced to output without yes. without getting as much input. Right. Right. And it really did take its toll. And then also in March, 21, my mother died. Oh, I'm so sorry and to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, that sort of put me into a bit of a tailspin. 
creatively for the next six or eight months or so. And so we decided, uh, Steve and I decided this year that I would pull back on teaching just a tiny bit. So the only, usually I would teach my year long class. And then also I would teach one or two other classes. We've dropped those extra classes and I'm only doing sort of maybe half of the the year long. Uh, Like my portion is about half because we have guest artists that are doing the other half. So I've really been able to basically to take a sort of half sabbatical uh, and I'm starting to really feel, uh, I mean, it's really important to take care of yourself and rest. And it's scary because it's like not as many people are going to sign up maybe for the class because it doesn't seem as, as much. Right. And that happened. Uh, There was a, a dip in numbers, but it's so worth it when now I feel like I have some space to innovate again. So um, as far as things that that inspire me, I'm very inspired by other artists' work. I love the Paul Clay and Picasso and uh, that era. Um, I love outsider art, which is sort of a a rugged folk art. (laughs) Um, I love children's art. I love contemporary illustration. So those artists really inspire me, other art. Um, I also love faces and animals. And I think that mostly, uh, and and I also do some flowers too, but the flowers seem to be almost like figurative in some ways. They're, they seem alive to me. And I, I think I'm less interested in, I'm definitely not interested in realism. What I'm more interested in is like the emotions of, uh, you know, and so usually the animals have sort of a perplexed look on their face or a grouchy look on their face. The humans are, I'm trying to sort of capture the moment when they're not smiling for the camera, for example, but are just sort of alone with their thoughts. Definitely. I mean, I've had a pretty big uh, internal, you know, lots of looking at my internal self and I do feel like my art is more about the emotions that these characters are having than anything else. Okay. So Carl, I'm going to ask you a tough question. It's okay. If you, you have trouble answering, how did your mother inspire your creativity when you were growing up? Now, I know you had that tough, she had Mm -hmm. made that tough comment to you. And so she clearly had a big influence on, on you and the way that you, you think and feel. So when you when you were a child, child before that, how did she um, encourage creativity in you, or did she? I think she was very proud of my artistic output. I don't have really great memories of my childhood, um, but I do think she was very proud, almost to the point of being braggy about it, which would give me would would, would make me embarrassed. Um, I do remember an incident. She was both really encouraging and also unbeknownst to her, very un, non-encouraging, uh, unencouraging. I remember an incident when I was about maybe eight and she, she was divorced and had a boyfriend named Jake. And um, I had spent a lot of time drawing a, a picture of them dancing uh, at a at a party. I was so proud of this picture. I mean, I, you know, he was in his suit and she was in her pretty dress and, and, and everything. And um, I remember being in the car and handing her the drawing. She was in the passenger seat and she burst out laughing. And it was not the, the uh, response I was hoping for as a very sensitive little girl. And it turns out that I had forgotten to put shoes on Jake. So he was in his suit he was all dressed up in his suit with bare feet. And to her, that was hysterical, but not in a way that included me in the joke. I, my, I, w- you know, I wish I was the kind of little girl that would have just laughed with her and, and seen it as something good, but I didn't, I, I saw it as a, as a criticism or, or, or whatever. So, so my mom was really unfiltered and um, especially if her emotions were involved or, or whatever. And so I have to say that probably just historically knowing who my mother was and everything, the message I, messages I got were mixed when she, you know, when she was happy and, and in a, a good mood, my art was wonderful. But if, if for some reason she felt threatened or she was trying to show off in front of somebody or something, then she would do things that, that were hard for a a kid like me. So, (laughs) so I would, I definitely feel that by the time that 16 year old event happened, I was sort of 
I must have been primed to quit. That's mm. you know what I mean. Like it, it didn't happen in a vacuum. Just that one incident. No, I think that and I can understand that if you had a difficult relationship with a mother who was an artist, that mm-hmm. and you wanted to distance yourself from that, and you yes. wanted to separate from your mother and was having trouble separating because it sounded like she would mix up. She was, there may have been a little codependency there. Maybe. Yeah. I'm not a psychologist. No, there was. Okay. Yeah. So well, just one where you're describing. So um, that you would, that would be natural for you to reject the part of you that was most like your mom. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And she was a, a teacher and I didn't think I wanted no, to be a teacher. Not a teacher. <laughs> so I didn't go to school to be a teacher, but it came, it came through anyway. And I'm really, I, I have to say that I do remember calling my husband when I was teaching at one of these events and we'd had a really good class. I'd had a really good class with eight people and some people had come in and they didn't draw at all. And other people had drawn for years, but they had lost their joy of drawing and they all left so happy. And I was so happy. And I called my husband and I'm like, this is my mission. This is just what I need to be doing. (laughs) And it still feels funny that it's important, you know, to that, that it would be important to help people get over the fear of drawing. But I I feel like it's been a, a gift Okay. for me as well. So Carla, this is airing, I think in the middle of April. So why don't you tell our listeners um, if they want to take a class with you? Um, I know you, your website is carlasinum.com. Do you have classes available all the time or do they start during certain times of the year? Both. So we have, we're kind of like a book publisher, maybe. We have like this backlist of, of classes that people can take at any time and get immediate access to all the lessons. Um, And so that's about 90% of our, or well, more, about 90% of our catalog is, or or more even, are these self-study classes that people can just purchase. But we also do it like, we try to mimic a live workshop in when the class first is released. So it would be as if you're watching a television show and there's a new episode every Tuesday. Uh, We kind of have that happen. And most of our classes go over a two week period. So the classes are Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, the video, the lesson two video isn't released until it's day. So that gives, that kind of forces people not to binge watch the whole Mm. class. It kind of tries to replicate a little bit more what we would do in a live workshop. I don't know about you, but when I'm having people in a live workshop do things, I don't necessarily tell them the whole story. We're doing this section and then later that this section will build on that section. But sometimes it's nice to not know where you're headed. It's better to just sort of do and trust and not try to plan it too much. What I found with my students is that if I give them all eight weeks of material on day one, they shut down. It's too overwhelming. And they're more likely to complete the course when we drip it out the way you're describing, because yes. then they're in, they're looking forward and anticipating each yes. class rather than think because something that can be done at any time is done at no time. Right, right. So that's how we do our new classes. So like in April, we will be having a class by Lori Rosenwald, who's a illustrator and artist that I've admired for years. Uh, she's very much uh, has, we, we share a similar mission in um, making a lot of work, at, you know, of all that work, there's going to be these little gems. She works very quickly. So it's kind of exciting. Uh, we also have a class coming up with Henrik Drescher, who's another il- illustrator that I have loved since the nineties when I used to work for the magazines. So I'm feeling really excited now that I'm starting to work with these people that I've sort of admired for so many years. But we have classes in drawing, painting, collage, mixed media, and then a few classes in off-topic things. We call them off-topic, but um, they're not really because creativity is everything and it all helps. All the classes are the same in a sense, but different. And we have classes in weaving and bookbinding and then caustic painting and can't remember. All but. right. Well, there'll be a lot to explore when they go to your website. Carla, thank you so much for joining me here today and sharing so authentically and vulnerably. I really appreciate it. 
And don't forget, if you like this episode, you'll have to check out my free masterclass. If you want to learn how to create realistic portraits in watercolor that capture a likeness, it's not as hard as you think. Go to shulmanart.com forward slash demo to learn how to get started. It's totally free and there's a lot of times to choose from. Again, that's shulmanart.com forward slash demo. Do you have any last words for our listeners before we call this podcast complete? I would say that every drawing, no matter whether it's you are beginning or experienced, has magic to it. And in some in some ways, the, the more accomplished you get, you'll, you might even lose some of the magic. So really, if you're new to drawing, really embrace that freedom that you have right now because it's all beautiful. And also go to your interests. If you don't want to draw people, don't draw people. <laughs> um, or don't draw people until one day you think, okay, I want to draw people because I want to try to, I just want, I'm ready to try. But I really would say that trust yourself. You will go with what you like and you will, um, you will eventually be ready to do what you need. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Alrighty, my friend. Thanks so much for being with me here today. I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Stay inspired. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com.